I'm John Batchelor. New book, A Stranger in Your Own City Travels in the Middle East Long War, is by an Iraqi journalist, Kaith Abdullah Had. It is extremely violent and determined to tell us the story of what it was to live in Baghdad. Born in 1975, he begins with a memory of his in his father's arms in 1980, watching a high performance aircraft in the sky, part of the Iran Iraq War that lasted almost a decade. Then again, there's the violence of the 1990s, the invasion of Kuwait. There's always Saddam Hussein abusing his people, being the one important person in all of the millions of Iraqis. And then come the Americans in 2003, the day of the invasion. Our hero is, is riding a green bike in the middle of Baghdad. Everybody's run away. And he sees the liberators arrive tear down a statue of Saddam Hussein. From that moment, everything goes wrong in the civil wars in Iraq. It is a blunt story telling how American policy misunderstood everything that it was doing to liberate the people of Iraq. Visiting this story again, there are no heroes. they are just survivors. Here is Haith Abdullahad from his office and home in Istanbul. I'm John Batchelor. It is April 2003, Baghdad, the spring of 2003. Raith Abdullahad is in Baghdad, and his new book, A Stranger in Your Own City, Travels in the Middle East Long War, record from that moment the entry of the Americans into the tragedy and mystery of Iraq in the 20th century and before. Raith, congratulations and good evening. You are in Baghdad observing these moments before the American armor column arrives. And at some point you see a gathering of American soldiers and Iraqis, Baghdad citizens, around a statue of Saddam Hussein in front of the Meridian and Sheraton Hotel. I'm following your reporting. What do you observe and what does it tell you now all these years later about the American presentation to the citizens of Iraq. Good evening to you. Good evening. I mean, you know, it's the most important image is the image that keep repeating itself again and again on TV as if it's that image to justify all that came after. Um, I stood there, I, I saw an American uh, Marine unit, I followed them, I stood in the square and I saw these, a few Iraqis who tried to topple the statue and, and, you know, I have to say the crowd of journalists gathered around the statue, which much larger, much bigger than the Iraqis themselves. And, and of course, all what you see on TV cameras is, is a group of Iraqis. But if you expand the lens a bit, if you stand on the other side, you would see a much larger group of journalists, foreign journalists gathered around the statue, waiting for the statue to be toppled. And, uh, and of course, eventually uh, the, the Marines kind of uh, bring one of their big kind of trucks and uh, one of these armored vehicles and put the noose around the statue and pull down the statue. And that's the image that plays again and again uh, on TV. It's the image, it's the moment I personally thought that this regime was over. But it was not Iraqi, a large Iraqi crowd who toppled the statue of Saddam Hussein. And that in itself is an introduction to the continual contradictions of the next years of the American presence, 2003 until the formal withdrawal in 2011. Although we all know that American presence continues in Iraq and in Kurdistan. We start at that moment because who is Graith Abdullahad at that moment? He's been waiting along with all of Iraq since the American campaign, bombing campaign started in the middle of March, the previous month, you have been on a, a, a wandering tour. I picture you on a, a green bicycle. I don't know why. That's the way I read your book. And at one point, you're detained by Iraqi security and you have two $50 bills in your shoes. What happens, Raith? And what does that tell you about the old regime? 
So it was actually a green bicycle, an old secondhand bicycle. And uh, and I was during the war, I was an architect, before the war, even before the war, I was an architect. I loved taking these tours around the city, uh, taking pictures, making some sketches. And during the war, stupidly, I was cycling around the city, taking pictures of bombed buildings, kind of. I thought I need to document that from an architectural perspective. And of course, uh, a man with a camera taking pictures in a city is basically, uh, you know, a spy in, in the regime's, uh, uh, you know, definition. I was arrested, uh, but the, the, the officer who arrested me knew that the game was over, that the Americans were very near. He confiscated, I mean, he took my camera, one of my cameras, and I bribed him with a $50 bill. And he let me go. And he told me not to leave the house, which exactly what I did for three days. I locked myself inside the house until my neighbor came knocking at my door and telling me the Americans are here. And the Americans are here. Now, what follows the Americans are here pulling a statue over is the looting of the city. And I picture it as if people are coming out into a world that is entirely new, but they, they've been stockpiling for days and they don't know whether there's going to be food or water or medicines again. So living through the looting of the city, at least those early days, who was in charge? Anybody? Were people wandering the streets with weapons? Was there a war? Was there a sense of something worse coming? Can you recall for us, Ray? It was the most absurd contradiction, uh, John. I mean, at one point you have this American army so so armed, you know, Abram tanks, armored vehicles, you name it, soldiers. And at the same time, you have utter chaos in the streets. So you have um, uh, looting, burning, you have people shooting in the middle of the street. So that sense of contradiction, uh, at one point you see those American soldiers standing, sometimes arresting people, sometimes detaining looters, other times just, just standing by and watching the looting going on. And of course, you know, the contradiction between securing the Ministry of Oil and letting the Iraq Museum getting looted, that is an image that stays in the mind of all Iraqis. Yes, and it also tells me what you don't see is that the Americans are not organized, extremely not organized for what comes after the fall of the regime. You meet an old man who says the Americans will fix everything. That was a general opinion at the time that the Americans couldn't be this disorganized. You know, John, it's I think for most of the Iraqis, they wanted to see the end of this regime of Saddam Hussein. I don't think anyone wanted to see a war, wanted to see another US bombing of Baghdad. I mean, we've been bombed by the Americans in 91, we've been bombed in 98. So no one wanted to see another bombing, but I think everyone wanted to see the end of Saddam. And once the statue was toppled and the regime collapsed, I think most of the Iraqis went into this Faustian deal. Okay, the Americans have invaded, well, at least they will fix the electricity, they will turn Baghdad into another prosperous town, because, you know, this is America, again, it, 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 this is the image that people have of such a well-armed army invading a city, and of course, what follows is, you know, American construction, American reconstruction, companies and all these things, but the utter chaos, the utter, the level of disorganization, it's almost criminal negligence, it is criminal, actually. You meet a journalist, James Meek is the one of my notes says, of The Guardian, and you secure a, a job that's going to lead you to become a journalist yourself. You become a translator. Was that a surprise to you, Raith, that suddenly you are the voice of Baghdad to the, uh, to the London readership? I mean, of course, it was a surprise. I mean, the end of the first day, I, we, we kind of hang out and hung out and we went around the city and I showed them a couple of buildings and he says, well, I'm hiring you as a, as a, as a translator. I mean, A, uh, let alone, I don't know anything about journalism. I have no idea what, how to progress, how to be a fixer in a city at war, how to do journalism. And it's, and it's basically, I call myself the, accident, the accidental journalist, but it, it started with, you know, doing journalism in my own backyard, going to my own friends and the streets and the neighborhoods before going to different cities and different parts of Iraq. And, and I want to emphasize this, that part of me was exploring my country for the first time, just like the foreign journalists, because uh, movement was so restricted in Iraq. The regime was, the regime 
police and security services. You couldn't just hop on a, a car and drive all over the country without a purpose, let alone without a proper ID card, which I didn't have. So, so part of me was going to all these towns and cities, Najaf, Karbala, uh, other parts of Iraq for the first time, actually. Raith Abdullahad, the author of A Stranger in Your Own City, travels in the Middle East long war. The Americans have arrived in Baghdad. What is it that they were witnessing? What? How did we get to this point of the bombings and the war? We need to start when Raith is very young in his father's arms in 1980, witnessing the Iran-Iraq war. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. Raith, you paint a beautiful scene of your father and showing you in the high in the sky over Baghdad, an F-4 Phantom. Who was your father at that moment? What did he make of the F-4 Phantom for the, I believe you were five years old? I was five. My father was a, what do we call, an amateur interested in aviation and planes and collected all these, uh, you know, foreign magazines about uh, airplanes and jet fighters. He had a few friends who were pilots in the Iraq Air Force. So this is where he could, you know, spot uh, uh, the F-4 flying over Baghdad. Um, I really remember that day as my first war. Uh, I went to my parents' bedroom. My father later took me to the roof, seeing that was the first time I hear the sounds of uh, heavy uh, anti-aircraft machine guns. And, and it's a very interesting point because, you know, John, because I think that's the point where all the miseries of Iraq started, that war with Iran, which led to Saddam having a very strong army, but a, but a bankrupt country, which led him to invading Kuwait in 91. And the history is the rest. Uh, the story includes... You witnessing a parade, my date says 1989, so you were a few years older. A parade, a victory parade, though the war ended with no clear winner. Both sides, as we witness in all wars, both sides extremely grief-stricken, but at the same time claiming success. You witness a parade where there are Iranian prisoners and Iraqi soldiers. I picture the parade marching by. And you get close enough for one soldier to give you a bullet. What did you make of that? Were you excited? Was everybody excited about that parade? So so the parade was before the end of the war. I mean, of course, there was massive parades after the end of the war. And as you say, both sides claimed that they came victorious. That specific parade, I think, was around 86. And I was still young. And and, I, and again, I remember my father kind of like lifting me to look at the trucks and the Iraqi soldiers and I'm waving my hands because, you know, militarization swept through the society. As kids, we were, uh, we were you know, we were all wearing military uniforms uh, to salute the flag on Thursday mornings, militarization, military cartoons, military drawings. Um, Saddam was dressed in a military so. We were all excited as children to see the soldiers passing by. And I remember this guy, this soldier who had the tired face and gave me this bullet, a red line around it. And, and I kept it for a long time. Little did I know that this was like an omen for all the wars to come. Saddam Hussein is someone we routinely refer to as the president or the dictator of Iraq. However, in the Iraqi Arabic language, he was called leader of necessity. Why? What did that mean to the Iraqi people? What did it mean to uh, uh, Saddam Hussein? So Saddam kind of, uh, you know, he comes from, follows the step of all these revolutionary uh, or tries to play the role of a re revolutionary pan-Arabist leader. So he donned the khaki uniform. He wore these big aviator glasses, smoked a cigar, and he was given you know, the kind of the cult of the leader, the cult of worshipping the leader. So he was given all these titles, the savior of the nation, the leader of the, <laughs> the people. And, and one of the titles, which I found the most absurd title was uh, in Arabic, the leader necessity. It's a, it's a, it, it's a very absurd title, it doesn't even make sense in Arabic. Uh, but it was one of these titles coined specifically for him and meaning what kind of the description of it was that this nation at a certain point will 
you know, bring this leader who lead the nation to victory and greatness. And of course, he did lead the nation, but let it led it to its utter defeat and demise. The second war is when America enters around the edges about the invasion of Kuwait and the pushing of the Iraqi army out of Kuwait. And you were at this point observing Saddam, the leader of necessity, undergoing a transformation. You also had ambition as an architect. So you were looking to a future both of architecture and of Saddam Hussein, who was a semi-religious leader. Is that how he responded to the defeat in Kuwait? So, John, you know, in the 90s, religiosity swept throughout the Middle East and and Saddam was very weakened. Uh, I mean, he personally was not weakened, but the state was weakened and his grip on the Iraqi population was weakened. So he used religiosity for religion uh, to fulfill two things. A, to portray himself as the pious, faithful leader, by that to counter any attempts by religious opposition parties. But two, to use religion as well as tribal uh, relation and the tribes themselves as a way to extend his authority to different parts of the population. Uh, You know, building mosques, uh, TV shows, uh, you know, about religion, radio shows about religion, uh, campaigns to memorize the Quran, all these elements he used to extend his control over the population. Because Saddam, in the first stage of his life, as he was portraying himself as the leftist revolutionary leader, the second stage, he was the pious tribal leader of the nation. And the sanctions regime are biting hard into the Iraqi people. My sense of uh, the sanctions, my memory is that there's a state within a state and the those who are endorsed by the regime do very well. At this point, however, I want to emphasize an observation that you make throughout the book. Iraq is not a sectarian division at this point. There are Shia who are prosperous and are blessed by the regime and there are Sunni who are the same. So it is not like... A, Saddam is a Sunni, and that means Shia are out. Have I got that right, Kareth, that the sectarian conflict came later and it was imposed? Absolutely, John. Look, I, I, Sunnis and Shia and Kurds and Christians and Turkmen are all components of the Iraqi population. Of course, there are religious differences. And a few hundred years ago, uh, you know, uh, religious wars and sectarian conflicts. But the Iraqi society, as it was in the 80s and 90s, was predominantly defined by class, by a place of birth, rather than by sex. So intersectarian marriages were a very common thing in Iraq. The sectarian narrative imposed on Iraq in which Saddam is a Sunni, then by association, all the Sunnis are oppressors of the Iraqi people. That narrative was created in exile in London and Tehran in the 90s and was used to market a, a, a regime change in Iraq, you know, along the side of, you know, the Kosovan wars, the Rwanda uh, wars. That narrative was created later and was brought later to Iraq. Again, I, I want to emphasize, it's not like I'm not saying that there are no Sunnis or Shia in Iraq. Of course there are. Of course they have social differences between them. But the sectarian conflict between the Sunnis and Shia of Iraq happened because of the 2003 war. The book is A Stranger in Your Own City, Travels in the Middle East Long War. Graith Abdul Ahad is the author. We're now back to the American occupation and the first civil war. It is now 2003-2004. Our protagonist, Graith, is a journalist, a photojournalist. He has a camera. He's attached to journalism, uh, English language journalism coming out of Iraq. He's acted as a translator. But it is now very much a war as observed by a keen, a, a keen member of the Baghdad city. In other words, this is a Baghdad resident who sees his own city transforming itself with American presence after the war, the looting after the war, the great relief people concerned about the future, the lack of American uh, uh, preparation, the blunder of dismissing the army, the blunder of driving out the Ba'ath Party, so there was no structure whatsoever, and the re-entry of exiles. And I, I'm keen on this, Wraith, because it's a story that we see 
repeated again and again through history. When the exiles come back, it's as if they're frozen in time. They remember a city they left. What did it mean for Iraq that the exiles rushed back in? Many of them would become leaders in the American version of Iraqi governance. John, this is a very, very accurate description. It's people who went back to a city and they were frozen in time. So when they left Iraq, some in the 50s, some in the 60s, others in the 70s, they lived in exile in cocoons of, of paranoia because the regime was hunting them. And the Iraq they had, took with them was very different from the Iraq that they came back to. That Iraq they came back to had suffered under the regime for 20, 30 years, had lived through the sanctions, the, the the, I mean, the cleavage between between the exiles and the Iraqis cannot be more emphasized. Many of those exiles were, you know, aligning themselves with Iran during the Iraq-Iran war, and and even for, well, I think, for most of the Iraqis, they saw that as a treason. If if and and they were some of them were taking part in the war against the Iraq itself. So so they came. Some of them wanted to avenge grievances, and they saw all the Iraqis. As complicit in these these grievances, um, they also because they grew up in exile, so they had very close uh, sectarian, but also very paranoid way of looking into the society in all. I mean, some of these. Uh, Political organization evolved like the communists, say, in the 19th century or the early 20th century, in tightly knit cells, paranoid, fearing the arm of Saddam. So they went, came to Iraq. Not only they didn't know Iraq, but the Iraqis themselves didn't trust them. But the exiles had one trump card, which is the Americans. The Americans who had no contact inside Iraq only listen to the exiles, Ahmed Chalabi, the rest, uh, even people like who became anti-American in the end. In the beginning, they were really the allies of the Americans. So the Americans not only had this, did not do their homework, they didn't know the country they were going to, dis disbanded all the security services, and allied themselves with the exiles and listened to the exiles as the voice of Iraq, the voice of Iraqis. And that's where the second disaster takes place. The violence begins directed against the occupiers, uh, the American army. The explanation in Washington is that these are former regime elements. Apparently you call them FREs and that, that was the end of the story. However, these are former regime elements who are looking to transform the country because of their anger. Um, Graith introduces this to one gripping char character. It's out of a novel, but he's a real person, Hamid. Hamid is a former Iraqi security officer. What is his thinking as he gathers together with his friends? They've been dishomed. They've been dis dismissed from the army. That was their career. How do they view the occupation? How do they view the future at this point, 2004, 2005? So 2000, if I go one step back, in 2003, although Hamid was one of the people who wanted to fight against the Americans to avenge his honor as, a, as an army, as a, as a security officer, he also wanted to see the end of the Saddam regime. So he waited at home, like the rest of his people, but when he saw the policies of the Americans, when he saw the, the targeting of his community, of his people, of his friends, he of course picked up arms and started fighting the Americans. But Hamid, very early on, realized the danger of the third disaster that was introduced by the American and Iraq. Because the Americans had no security over the country, they, they did not secure the borders. So any people who wanted to fight the Americans or the grievance of the Americans flooded to Iraq. So suddenly the jihadis who had no presence in Iraq before the American invasion, suddenly had a huge presence in Iraq. They came from Somalia, from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Yemen. Hamid was one of those people who early on realized the danger of, of, of this, if the Sunni insurgency associated itself with the foreign jihadis, which eventually became Al-Qaeda, because he realized that those guys had different goals from the goals of people like him. The jihadis wanted to fight the Americans and establish you know, the Islamic Khilafat, basically, while Hamid and the others wanted to fight the occupiers and preserving a thing called Iraq. So you can basically say Iraqi nationalists versus foreign jihadists. He's a senior commander, Hamid. At this point, there is no sectarian violence that I can see. 
These are Iraqi patriots rising up to take possession of their, how is it, honor, pride? How do they think of themselves in, in being resistance? Are they restoring their dignity? What, what is your memory of it, Grace? I mean, Joe, for, for, a, for a brief moment, I think sometime in 2003, there was what we can call patriotic resistance, a very brief moment before they started killing civilians and kidnapping and doing all these things. But you know, any group of people, I mean, let alone the Americans and all the weapons and, you know, any people who are occupied by a different nation, and uh, there is a brief moment in which the people would stand and look and see what this foreign occupier is going to do in their country. But when they see the foreign occupiers behaving in such an atrocious way, I mean, there is Abu Ghraib, the, the, the scandal of torture of Abu Ghraib. You see the daily humiliation of Iraqis at checkpoints. Every single Iraqi, I myself, we were so humiliated every time we passed an American checkpoint, you know, with their guns pointing at you. So, of course, a group of people, especially with military training, would pick up arms and start fighting the Americans. This is the beginning. But of course, it all ended into the sectarian quagmire and and the civilians who paid the biggest price for all these wars. Fallujah was presented as an evidence of the resistance of the Iraqi people and also Al-Qaeda. It was the fairy tale we were told at the time. I'm not reporting this as history. Why Fallujah? Why did that city become so important to the Americans? Why did it why was it so resistant to the overwhelming firepower that was directed against it, both in the spring of 04 and then again right after the election in November of 04? Well, because Fallujah itself is, is a very small town, very conservative town, uh, but also a very proud town. And what started as a demonstration against American presence in Fallujah in 2003 uh, ended in uh, uh you know, in, in, in shooting at civilians, then you have a revenge attacks against the Americans. And because also Fallujah sits in the middle of the desert along the highway that connects Iraq to Jordan and Syria. So it's a very good convenient point to A, attack the Americans, but also for all the, for the jihadis, local and foreign to congregate in Fallujah. And again, very early on, you see this, this marriage of convenience between Iraqi nationalist army officers fighting the Americans and Islamic jihadis who come to fight the Americans for their own goals. And, and in the second battle of Fallujah, one of the commanders, I mean, there I met foreign jihadis, Syrians, Yemenis, Saudis, Tunisians, but also I met an Iraqi commander who was also telling me how a, a big mistake uh, was for the for the Iraqis to align themselves with the foreign jihadis, because that will end in the total destruction of the city. We now have a player from the outside, Jordanian, I believe, who was most mentioned in the news reporting in America, uh, Zarqawi. Zarqawi, I was told at the time, had a vision of starting a sectarian war uh, in order to destroy Iraq and, I guess, advance the goal of the Islamic State or the caliphate globally. He was a non-Iraqi. Was he disregarded because he was not Iraqi? Was he, was he regarded as, as a threat the same way the Americans were? So eventually, by 2005, six, the Iraqis start looking at, at foreign jihadis like Zarqawi and others as, as an equal danger to the Sunni community as the Americans. But I have to say something here. You know, Zarqawi was a contributor to the sectarian civil war. The idea of a creating a civil war was not a Zarqawi thing. It's the conditions created by, by both the Americans, the, the exiles, and the foreign jihadis, all these three elements contributed to creating a sectarian civil war. So of course, Zarqawi comes to, to Iraq, uh, takes advantage of the security vacuum. He wants to fight America. He's a, a disciple of bin Laden. And he sees this, this is the field where I can fight the Americans. So, so he starts attacking and then evolves his ideology and strategy to drug all the Sunni community. And of course, the Sunni insurgency allies themselves with people like Zarqawi, but very soon realize that they're fighting on two fronts, fighting the Americans on one side, but also fighting Shia militias and death squads. And these were part of the Iraqi uh, government security forces. Uh, 
working in tandem with Shia militias on the ground. And within one year, the Sunnis were defeated in Baghdad and the rest of the country. And that's when there is a, a strategic shift in the Sunni insurgency mentality. And that's when they decide to ally themselves to the Americans to get rid of the jihadis. One detail before we go on to the fate of Saddam Hussein and the rise of the Prime Minister Maliki. What is the Mehdi army at this point, 2004, 2005? Is it a significant factor? Absolutely, it's a significant factor. The Mehdi army, which started in 2003 as groups of young Shia religious uh, men influenced by the teaching of the father of Muqtada Sadr, who was an anti-American cleric in Iraq. And they started fighting the Americans in 2003, just as the Sunnis were fighting in Fallujah, they were fighting in, in Najaf. Eventually, by the start of the civil war, they evolve into the Shia militia, and then they start becoming a kind of a death squad, kidnapping Sunni men, uh, torturing, killing them, uh, you know, uh, ask, you know, taking ransoms for all these kidnappings. And very, very soon they break into different gangs that terrorize the city and they have like any any gang in a civil war. Um, you know, it's it's a very the ideology is of course the background for killing a man, but taking his house, taking his car, taking his property becomes the real motive. The book is A Stranger in Your Own City, Travels in the Middle East, Long War. Raith abdul is the author. When we come back, Saddam Hussein, The Trial. Raith, I learned from you that you saw Saddam Hussein, the leader of necessity, twice, once as a youth and again in the trial. What is What struck you as the change that you observed in him when he entered the courtroom? So, John, as I said, you know, I grew up in the shadow of Saddam. And for me, when I was a child, he was something like, you know, bigger than God in our lives. And I remember when I was a child, seeing him on top of a Mercedes car, waving to the crowd. The second time when I saw him was this um, frail old man, white beard, entering the courtroom. And that court, that trial of Saddam, it could have been another point in which the Iraqis would have learned something about their history. It could have been a moment of reckoning with our history, turned into a sham, into a victor's justice. It was a, you know, it was a parody of justice. It actually, what the trial did, turned Saddam from that defeated criminal into a dignified old man. And it gave him the opportunity because the people who were opposed to him were so bad, to, gave him the opportunity to redefine himself and re-enter the, not only the Iraqi, but the Arab psyche as this man standing against the American, standing up against the American. Saddam is executed and, December 2006. That alone was a significant report here. What I didn't know until I read your book is that after his death, his body was taken to uh, the prime minister's house, Maliki, who was who was breaking from a wedding of one of his children to observe the body of Saddam Hussein. It's a, the the word macabre doesn't do adequate to it. What does this tell us about Maliki? What what was he thinking? It tells you how petty sectarian mentality he had. I mean, uh, the wedding of the son was held on that day to celebrate the execution of Saddam. And I think there are more details that emerged recently in which the guests and the bodyguards were invited to uh, spit on the corpse, uh, hit it with flip-flops. It was at one point dumped on a pile of rubbish. Again, it is it is this petty mentality of, of uh, taking revenge, which had... Uh, you know, you know, Saddam achieved one victory maybe in his death. He he has, you know, occupied the, the mentality of people like Maliki, forcing his enemies to become like him, to behave like him, uh, conspiratorial, uh, petty, filled with hatred, and building their own, of course, corrupt uh, mini states. The civil war ends with the defeat, the apparent defeat of the Sunnis, the Shia in control of the government, 
the Dawa party is identified with the Shia. Sadr is identified as the head of a Mahdi army. And so at one observer says, we've traded the tyranny of Saddam for the tyranny of Sadr. However, I want to go to an image that Graith gives us that is vivid and scary. Graith, what is Sada, S-A-D-D-A? Sada means the dam. Uh, it's, some, it's, uh, it's the fortification around the city of Baghdad built, to, uh, built in the 50s to stop the flooding waters from entering the city. It's basically the furthest edge of Baghdad. It's beyond the slums of the city, but it also became the place where the bodies of the kidnapped uh, Sunnis were dumped. Uh, I entered that place in 2008, and, and again, the word macabre is not enough to describe it. I mean, John, imagine a football pitch filled with tiny objects, spoons, bottles, uh, broken glass. Each one of these objects was marking a grave because the militiamen will come and dump the bodies at night and the locals will come and, and just kind of cover them with some, some dirt and mark the grave with an object. So you go there and you see these hundreds of objects scattered along this land. And these are all graves of, of people. And this is said there, and, and it became this kind of joke, this kind of a macabre joke, of course, oh, they took him to said there, meaning he's not coming back. One of those people who didn't come back is Hamid. Uh, my notes here says you had a conversation with him in 2007. Forgive me if I have the year wrong. And he was acting odd, strange, pursued. He disappeared. Is that all we know of him? That's all we know. I mean, when I talked to him in 2007, exactly, uh, he was, he had left his area because he opposed Al-Qaeda and the jihadis in his area. So. So they were after him. So he fled to Baghdad. But also in Baghdad, the Shia militias were after him. So when the last time I talked to him, the last time I met him, he was very scared and paranoid. His younger brother was killed. He was being uh, chased. And, and after that, he, he disappeared. And to this day, we don't know if he was killed by the jihadis, by the Ministry of Interior death squads, or if he was killed by the militia. We do believe that he's gone, however. Just to note, 30 seconds, Iraqis are leaving the country in great numbers if they can get a passport out at this point. It starts, uh, it starts for the privileged and the educated, and they scatter around the earth. They're out there now in the diaspora. Is that correct? Uh, they, they, they have a, a moment here where their children will go back to Iraq. I'm trying to be as positive as possible. We have 30 seconds. I mean, of course, tens of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis fled. I don't think that children are going to Iraq. I, I think that by 2015-16, another wave of Iraqis were fleeing the country. The book is Raith Abdul Ahad's A Stranger in Your Own City, Travels in the Middle East Long War. Maliki is the prime minister. Saddam is set, uh, dead. The first civil war is over. The second more horrible ahead. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. Kreith, a very good evening to, again to you. And we begin the conversation with a high school friend of yours whose name, we're got, Nam de Guerre, is Hassan. You find him sheltering in his family's home in the northern part of Baghdad, behind locked doors. This is a Baghdad that is unrecognizable from 15 years before. It's divided into concrete blocks and also people are keeping neighborhoods of Shia, Sunni, and everything in between. Hassan, what does he tell you about his life and his medical degree and how he is living? Good evening to you again. Good evening, John. I mean, Hassan was, was a high school friend and we used to walk from my high school into his house when we ran away from school uh, to avoid one of these spontaneous uh, demonstrations. But in after the first phase of the, first, the civil war, trying to retrace my, my footsteps, my, my route back into Hassan's house, I realized that um, you know, the neighborhoods have been divided. There are two walls now separating the high school from Hassan's house. And that to go into that, one needs to leave one enclave, drive up and down a highway, enter a second enclave to, to 
to find another neighborhood. And of course, the whole geography of Baghdad had, had changed by that time. I managed to trace him, I managed to find him. And, and of course, he tells the story. I mean, we as journalists, we witness the horror, you know, selectively. We go, we see a story, we come back. But for the people of Baghdad, and Hassan was like them, they had to live through it day by day. So he describes the time when a car bomb went uh, right in front of him, when he was stopped at the checkpoint and they asked for ID card and, and he could have been killed. So all these stories, where, uh, you know, the common experience of Baghdadis at the time. The state of corruption, which is how you present this transformation from the first civil war that ended 2007 with the defeat of the Sunnis and the second civil war where there, it's all against all, uh, we will explicate. The state of corruption is that the regime in Baghdad, uh, Maliki's regime, is dominated by men and players who are eager for money and are endorsing the sectarian conflict, making money on the sectarian conflict, how do they see their role? The Americans are about to leave Baghdad formally in 2011. Uh, in that time of between the end of the first civil war and the exit of the Americans, how is Maliki's government regarded in Baghdad? Well, John, I mean, Maliki had a, an amazing opportunity to end the civil war because by the by 2008, the Sunnis, as you say, were defeated. Uh, many of their former insurgents commanders had turned into allies to them with the Americans. They fought with the Americans against the jihadis. For they were expecting to be reincorporated into the society, given jobs, given salary, the same thing that was happening with the Shia militia commanders. Instead, Maliki pursues a very sectarian policies, going after those, not only those commanders, the former commanders, but also going after former um, Sunni politicians, the vice president, others. And, and that kind of entrenched this, the sense of you know, the Sunni defeat, the Sunni uh, disillusionment with the government of, of Nur al-Maliki. And of course, uh, sorry, yes. Please continue. So Nur al-Maliki also, in the second elections, uh, he came second. The main, the winner of the elections was a coalition of secular, uh, you know, trans-sectarian coalition of Sunni, Shia, Kurds, and Arabs. And, and but the Americans and the Iranians both wanted Nur al-Maliki. The Iranians, because he was their client, the Americans, they thought we, and it's Biden, by the way, who was leading the, the Iraq uh, portfolio, they thought they can, they can deal with a strong man, a Shia strong man like Nur al-Maliki. So they allowed Nur al-Maliki, who came second, to manipulate the votes, to get a ruling from the Supreme Court. And, and, and many believe that the kind of whatever Iraqi democracy we had died that day when, when Nur al-Maliki was allowed to form a, a, a government again. That government, as you said, was built on corruption, was building a, a patronage client network. Uh, the military was turned into money-making machines, uh, military units which had soldiers on the paper in the thousands, in reality had nothing more than hundreds, and the rest, the difference were salaries siphoned by the military commander. That was the state of the Iraqi army and the security forces at the eve of ISIS emergence and the Second Civil War. Yes, the Second Civil War begins with next door Syria collapsing in its own civil war, bringing in from across the Ummah. I have a list, Turks, Chechens, Tajiks, Pakistanis, uh, and all of them gathering in Syria, but that will they'll quickly spill over into Iraq. And the question is, who is who is against whom? It's it gets lost. The Free Syrian Army starts as an idea to oppose Assad, and it becomes an aspect, a, a recruiter for Al Nusra. What is Al Nusra's place? That's Al Qaeda's. Syrian presentation. What is Al-Qaeda's place in Iraq at this time? We've not spoken of the jihadis much other than to reference Zarqawi, but how does, how does Al-Nusra present itself? 
Well, well, John, by 2008, nine, uh, basically Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, was was defeated. They they fled the major cities, the major Sunni cities. They they ended the, uh, kind of somewhere in the desert, in the desert region between Syria and and Iraq. And that was the situation that Al Qaeda found itself at the eve of the Syrian civil war. The Syrian civil war created the opportunity, as you say, everyone against everyone. Um, the chaos of the Free Syrian Army, everyone is funding them, Europeans, Gulf Arab countries are arming them, the Iranians are there, the Russians come later. So in that chaos of the Syrian civil war, the jihadis find a niche for themselves. They equip themselves, they arm themselves by fighting other battalions, capturing weapons, many Western supplied weapons. And unlike the, the other kind of militias, the jihadis are very disciplined. So they build their own internal or recreate their internal networks, reconnect with the with their people across the border in Iraq. And, and it's then in this kind of, in the really charged sectarian atmosphere in the Middle East that a, a Sunni attempts to create to re mimic or recreate the Arab Spring in Iraq, uh, basically deteriorate or dis you know uh, collapses into an ISIS takeover of Sunni towns and cities. And finally, the Friday of anger, December 2012. This is on the eve of what we know to be the rise of the Islamic State. That's Sunni rising, correct? All and they're united in their op opposition to Maliki and nothing else. <laughs> It, it is another it is another one of these uh, you know moments in Iraqi history that you would stop and think uh, this is another crucial moment again the Sunnis or the Sunni leaders I have to say the Sunni leaders tribal elders bunch of mavericks who decide to go into another fasting deal again with the jihadis thinking we will use the jihadis to defeat Maliki and then we will take over again. But of course, I mean, they tried this once and they failed and they tried it again. And of course they will fail. So what started as genuine uh, Sunni demonstrations soon was infiltrated by the jihadis, by other elements. And, and within the chaos, I mean, look, it's the same story everywhere. It's in Afghanistan, it's in Iraq, it's in Yemen. It's a, the jihadis are they benefit from the chaos, the chaos created by civil wars, by foreign invasion, by Western intervention. And in that chaos, the jihadis as a small disciplined force can, can, can find a space for themselves. They did the same thing in Iraq after 2012. Uh, they captured a couple of towns, but their biggest ultimate victory was capturing Mosul, Iraq's second biggest city. And that happened Again, because Maliki or the Iraqi army forces, security forces there were perceived as sectarian, as oppressive, uh, you know, oppressing the people. And ISIS portrayed itself at the beginning as uh, quote unquote liberators for the, to the people of Mosul. The corruption within the Iraqi security forces led to their uh, defeat, collapse. They withdrew from the city, leaving tons of equipment uh, Humvees and you know you name it in the hands of ISIS, which again led to unspeakable kind of atrocities. I learned from Haith that it's five hundred miles or kilometers from Baghdad to Mosul. I can't remember Haith. Kilometers. Kilometers. Yes, five hundred kilometers, and along that is a road of horror. And we're going to one city in particular that illustrates the Sunni disorder. And that's Ramadi, a stranger in your own city, travels in the Middle East long war. Raif Abdul Ahad is the author. I'm John Batchelor. Halfway between Baghdad and Mosul is a city called Ramadi. We heard about it much in the Sunni awakening of 2007. Well, it's back, except one witticism that we learn in the telling of this story is that I believe when the women want to uh, the women of the Sunni women want to make certain that you're going to have a bad time. They say something like, may you have many sheiks in your clan or your tribe. What does that mean, Haith? Why do they say that? It, it's not only the Sunnis, but it's in, in every tribal society in Iraq, if, if women want to curse a, a woman from another tribe, they say, may Allah increase the, you know, the tribal elders in your society, because the more sheikhs, the more tribal elders you have, 
in, in a tribe, the more infighting you have, and, and every one of them will try to use outside powers to increase their, uh, you know, their influence. And this is exactly what's happened in Ramadi, which is to the west. Yeah, in Baghdad is here, Mosul is there, uh, Ramadi is to the west. And, and uh, you know, different Sunni politicians, tribal elders, forces to, you know, some, some use the power of Maliki to fight others. Some kind of use the power of the jihadis, align themselves and align themselves with the Americans. And, and this internal infighting between the Sunnis, I mean, sometimes I call what's been happening in Iraq over the past 20 years, I mean, until ISIS, is the tragedy of the Sunnis. Because, you know, the Sunnis in Iraq never saw themselves as a monolithic unified force. They, they are people of different cities, a mercantile Mosul, a tribal Ramadi, rural Diyala, the Americans came and they perceived the Sunnis as a one sect and pushed them into a corner, uh, targeted them with lots of sanctions, and then they told them, go and come back with a political uh, project. Of course they couldn't. And this infighting, this Sunnis, you know, inability to create a coherent political plan has led to all these disasters along the last, uh, you know, 10, 15 years, 15 years in Iraq. I believe you are in Ramadi when fighting breaks out. There was a chaotic scene, gunfire, people fighting during the day, sleeping at night, no one secure. It very much felt like you had descended into uh, another country, a country where no one was safe whatsoever. Was that the experience that you remember? Uh, I, mean, I remember... I remember very well this day when we're standing at this kind of market next to a market and people kind of collecting their stuff, uh, you know, trying to put their families in the back of pickup trucks, fleeing the city. Uh, the government forces are besieged in the government house, the you know militias everywhere. And we saw this, a car with a couple of gunmen inside. And I asked my friend who's local from Romadi, who are those people? And as the group of neighbors each gave a name to a different faction, and I counted, and there were like, I don't know, 12, 14 different factions fighting inside the Ramadi. And, and of course, Islamic State, ISIS was one, versus, you know, Iraqi government, intelligence service, militias, uh, special forces. It was, it was chaos. You never knew who was fighting whom. And the violence is commonplace and continuing and is not resolved until the rise or the presence of ISIS, which in your telling, I understand, is much more organically part of this chaos. ISIS represents, it's a Sunni organization, but it represents a, a order in the chaos. And Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, a former member of the Air Force, I believe, a security officer, uh, was representing a refuge for all of the young men who had been resisting Shia, resisting the Americans, resisting the violence, really a criminal behavior. But uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi gave them, what, a mission? How did, how was he first regarded before the conquest of Mosul? What was, what was the opinion? Look, I mean, ISIS, after the defeat of Al-Qaeda, I mean, the jihadis got a really bad reputation amongst the Sunnis of Iraq themselves. And, and of course, you know, no one could believe that the jihadis could resurrect themselves and come back. But again, as you said, uh, Maliki sectarian policies, the criminal behavior of the Iraqi security forces, the chaos amongst the Sunnis allowed the jihadis to regroup and come back. They did not advertise themselves first as Islamic State or, or a Qaeda, you know, 2.0, but kind of they tried to masquerade themselves in different names. When they took over, and, and again, they were disciplined, they had forces, many of the young kids, uh, you know, a lot joined them. I mean, of course, many fought against them. We have to remember it's the Sunnis who fought against uh, ISIS as much as the Shia and everyone else. But also they, they found a crack in the society in Iraq and they infiltrated that crack until they established themselves as a military power. And then they went uh, basically killing Sunni, Shia, Kurds and Christians and everyone who did not agree with their... Uh, 
mad ideology. It's 2014. Have the Iranians dispatched advisors at this point, or is that later? Is that 2015, 2016? I don't know when they first showed up. I mean, one can argue the, the Iranians showed up the day after the Americans entered Baghdad. Okay, uh, okay. that's a good day. Uh, you know, because because I spoke with the, with the Iraqi guy who was working with the Iranian intelligence service, and he told me when the, the British occupied Basra, they came in a convoy of you know, jeeps, pickup trucks, they didn't know if they were going to find the British or what's the deal. And of course, the British not only did not find men, the Americans, but they actually used men who were trained in Iran to become the backbone of the new Iraqi security forces. From an an Iranian, sorry. Let's go on to the Battle of Mosul. Uh, And because the Iranians are a predicate for that. A Stranger in Your Own City is the book, Haraith, Abdul Ahad is the author. I'm John Batchelor. The Iranians are on the battlefield. The Islamic State is now dominating Mosul. Islamic State has established itself as a caliphate. What that means for the rest of Iraq is power in, in the northern part of Iraq and Mosul and doubts about the Shia-dominated regime in Baghdad. The Iranians are present to help recapture cities such as Ramadi and Fallujah from the Islamic State. I, uh, the reason the Islamic State gets so much attention uh, these days still is that they practiced horrors. Now, at some point, there was a recognition by the jihadis that we did it wrong the first time, that we alienated the people by being brutal and cruel. We executed not only the person, but his cousin and his cousin's cousin. We're not going to do that anymore. Was that something the ISIS people forgot or didn't practice? Because the Spiker massacre that you explicate very carefully, the the mass slaughter of 1,700 or more recruits by ISIS authorities, suggests that they didn't follow their own recommendation to be generous. I mean, of course they can't. So what they do is they they always talk about, oh, you know, so it's all these kind of kind of movements, mil- militant movements. They will say, oh, in our previous attempts, we, we committed so much horrors. Uh, the next time we will not do it. And, and of course, in Mosul, the people of Mosul believed that, you know, again, delusionally. They thought like, oh, these new, these new outfits will behave better than before. But within two months, it is the Sunnis themselves of Mosul who came to, you know, to bear the, the, the worst uh, of, of the, the, the behavior of ISIS. They, they were basically kidnapped in their own city. They had to uh, abide by the extremist religious rulings. Women were not allowed to leave the house. Schools almost collapsed. The whole city, uh, one of most vibrant cities in Iraq uh, came to a standstill and collapsed under the rule of ISIS. And that's when ISIS is defeated, basically. It's it's defeated when it, when it alienates the people that it supposedly, reportedly came to protect uh, before it's defeated militarily by, by other factions in the, in the war. Mosul is a very large city. And we then turn to, this is, this is combat, house to house, overpass to underpass, some very brave people, special forces of the Iraqi army. Now, much has been said of the Iraqi army collapsing once, twice, thrice. Much has been said of the Iraqi army not standing up to the advance of ISIS. But in the summer of 2017, you follow Lieutenant Ali, you follow other young men who are fighting the ISIS dug in in urban warfare, the hardest, as I read, the hardest kind of warfare there is for people who are completely well supplied. They're counting on the Americans. Somewhere in the background, Americans are in a building calling in airstrikes. But this horror house to house with the with the Mosul people inside, in the basements, being used as hostages, this suggests that we've got a generation of young people in Iraq who have PTSD, who have nightmares. Is that true? Absolutely. I mean, sometimes, so as you said, I followed this unit for almost a year. And and every time I go back to the unit, I ask, where is so-and-so? And they tell me, oh, he was injured, he was killed. 
But there also there was, I would say, a number of men who they would not recognize as suffering from PTSD or mental illness, who they would describe to me who carry their guns in the middle of the night and start shooting at their friends or or start talking in their sleep. So the, 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 the emotional and mental toll of these wars are immense, immense on the soldiers, on the civilians. I mean, it's very rightly so when you say it's a house to house, but sometimes they were fighting within rooms of the same house, you know, I, I, kind of in this room, you have a, a, a unit of ISIS. In the next room, you have Iraqi special forces. They literally fought over every single meter uh, from north of Baghdad until they reached the old city of Mosul, which is even more complicated in terms of geography, tiny and narrow alleyways, uh, thick stone walls, and the war there, you know, was was horrible. I want to do both sides of the equation here because ISIS is not a monolith. These are not characters out of a Hollywood movie. They they the reporting you provide is they had many languages, many ideas of who the commander is, no particular assumption of which tribe or which clan would lead us. Sometimes they were taking orders, sometimes they were just pointing at each other. Who were who were these young people? Where did they come from that to think that they could conquer the Iraq army? Their inspiration. What what can we say of them today? Because they're scattered throughout the region. So I mean, the most important thing to 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 acknowledge the fact that those are not only uh, Iraqis or Arabs or people from the Middle East. They were Belgians, French, uh, you know. Um, U.S. American converts, British, so it was a kind of a when it emerged in Syria, it was like this quote unquote the success story. This is why nearly twenty thousand foreigners flooded into the region, who would later became the backbone of ISIS. So they go everything from I was told about a Belgian uh, electrician to doctors to, uh, you know, the Chechens who were, uh, you know, fierce fighters. But also there are people from villages in Iraq. I mean, I interview one guy, not interview, basically. I tell the story of one, one guy who joined ISIS when he was 14 because his brother told him to do so. And within three years, he finds himself trapped in the old city. And of course, he was captured, tortured, and executed later. So, so ISIS was a melange of all these uh, different people who wanted to believe in in some messianic kind of uh, entity. They were defeated in Mosul house to house, but they were not defeated to my understanding. They were they withdrew at some point from the western part of the city and went back to Syria. They're in. Is they're in Syria today? Where are the veterans of Mosul, the ISIS veterans of Mosul? So I would say a lot of the ISIS veterans of Mosul are dead. But as you say, uh, some of them withdrew to Syria where they where they kind of had the final battle in Syria. But the biggest disaster as we speak is the, the, the ISIS camps inside Syria. These are large camps run by the Kurdish uh, militias. And we're talking about thousands of people. Among them, thousands of children. And those children have been captured there for the last five, six years. You know, a child who was there at the age of nine is now 14, 15. We, ha we are talking about a new generation of ISIS being um, radicalized in these Guantanamos in the middle of the desert. You know, because they don't have enough forces to, to you know, to secure them, uh, the foreigners, the countries do not want their foreign nationals, the Australians, the others, they don't want to take back their nationals. So you suddenly have this um, time bomb uh, in, the, in the desert at the moment. You have a scene that is at first extremely promising about the city after the battle. This is a day in which a family wakes up and going to take a ferry to an island in the river where there's amusement park, a setting, and uh, treats for the children. It turns into a horror because the ferry collapses into the river. 
and so many are drowned, so many are lost. It's 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 over much, Hythe. I understand your reporting. It's over much that these people of Mosul have put up with so much. How are they today? This is now five years, six years later. I would say kind of, you can still, of course, see the, the signs of war. The problem in Mosul at the moment is the corruption, which led to the ferry sinking, the, the, the dynamic, the, the, it's still there. The corruption, the, the militias who took part in the fight against ISIS are now running uh, economy sectors in the city. They control smuggling routes. So, so that's the problem in Mosul at the moment. Mosul is not, uh, is not recovering, not because the effects of the war, but because of the corruption, because of the powers that control Mosul at the moment. And of course, this, sorry. The, the, their memories, do they talk about it? Do they talk about <laughs> bad times and reflect uh, on them? It's an onion of horror. You peel a layer and you see another layer of horror and you peel and you see another layer. I went to talk about the, the story of the people who survived the, this very sinking, which sunk because of the corruption and the people running it. And as I'm talking the stories of those people who lost relatives, a, a man who lost his wife and, and three children in the sinking of the ferry, he tells me, but I've lost another child two years before during the fight against ISIS. I talked to this woman who lost a son and she tells me how her husband uh, was lost because of the war. So yeah, and it, that's... Uh, it's like one of these fables of 1001 Night. You tell a story, and within that story, there is another story. It's exactly like this, and not only in Musa, unfortunately, in the rest of Iraq. The book is A Stranger in Your Own City, Travels in the Middle East Long War. Raith Abdul Ahad is the author. The battle for Mosul is done. Iraq is reestablished as a sovereign state. The U.S. has left largely its with its military, still contractors, still contracts and development. Iran is president, and we're going to come back, and it's October 2019. And surprisingly, the young people have opinions, an uprising, a promising uprising. Basra, 2019. Baghdad, 2019. But in this particular instance, it's dealing with the status quo ante, which is dominated by unemployment, and anger at the ruling class. I hope I have that right, right? Anger at the Absolutely. ruling class. Absolutely. And who Absolutely. is the ruling class in 2019? We are talking about a kleptocratic elite of party bosses, uh, militia commanders, religious figures who have been siphoning, uh, according to different uh, estimates, around $20 billion a year from the Iraqi budget during the last 20 years. These, these figures, these kind of political bosses, um, have created uh, such a state of, of corruption in Iraq that it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, Iraq is not a poor state. We have $100, $120 billion worth of oil every year. But you go to certain parts of Baghdad and there's no water, no electricity, no employment, let alone the south of the country. So it's just this young generation, a young generation that grew up after 2003, that was, they were promised democracy, they were promised you know, prosperity. They woke up one day after the defeat of ISIS and they looked up at the situation and they realized the biggest uh, threat to their life is Excellent. corruption. It's a generation that grew up after 2003 that were promised, you know, democracy. They were promised prosperity, and they, and they looked at their lives and they realized that the biggest threat to, to not only themselves to Iraq and in in, in, to, in general is corruption and the corruption of these political elites, and and this is the, I mean, the uprising itself failed because all uprisings fail, but. What this, what we call a Tishreen uprising, the October uprising, it, it created a benchmark. It created a point when it is a trans-sectarian. It is where people from different parts of the city, the wealthy, the poor, the Sunni, the Shia, the different, who all poured into the central square in Baghdad. And they all chanted 
against the corruption of the political elite. It was a rare moment of, of Iraqi unity. I mean, again, if we speak in, in sectarian terminology, these are the kids from the poor Shia suburbs waving the flags of Imam Hussein, denouncing Shia clergy and Shia political bosses. That was an amazing moment in which the sectarian spell of 2003 fell and collapsed. And, and was a, a beautiful moment of unity. And of course, the, the political establishment, if we want to call it that, they're not even establishment political parties and militias, used violence against them. So 600, 700 young men and women were killed, thousands were injured, uh, and the oppression succeeded in the end in breaking the, the, the demonstration. But the spirit of Tishreen is still there. You introduced us to a young woman, I believe she's 30 years old at this time. Rahad, how do you say her name? Rahad. Rahad. And she is suddenly politicized. And she and other women go out of the house and participate in the demonstrations. Uh, this is extremely unusual, correct? Yes, it was very unusual because, you know, that part of Baghdad, Tahrir Square, is a very rough part of the city. And even in in in... Peaceful times, you don't see women. But what the demonstration created, created this, I don't know what I call it, a sense of solidarity. A woman, students, doctors poured into the streets, uh, a sense of unity. I mean, many of the medical students uh, started working as medics in the camps. Ragat was one of those people who, you know, she comes from a conservative part of the city, but she decided to go participate in the demonstrations, take part in the political discussions, volunteer to, uh, you know, to help in the in the tents and, and, and all these things. And when I asked Ragat, it's like, how come women in Iraq took such a major role in these demonstrations? What she said was amazing. She said, it, women were always part of the political uh, debate in Iraq, politics political scene in Iraq. It's only the violence that pushed them, they had, they had to take shelter from the violence. But Tishreen allowed them to go back into the street and participate again in the political life. The October 19 moment is redemption, but then again, the brutality closes in. The unemployment is there. The, as you say, the, there, it, there's, there are resources in Iran its GDP grows in Iraq. Its GDP grows every year. But I'm keen on how your book is received in Iraq. This is a revelation to me. I reported on this very these very same events, and I didn't have any of this information about the other side or about the complications of the battles. How are the people in Iraq receiving it? Is it published in Arabic already? It's not published in Arabic yet, and I, I hope it will not be published for some time, because, you know, I, I can, I can, you know, you survive by, by not being uh, read in Arabic. But, but something else very important I want to say is for the people of Iraq, this is their daily life. I did not break any, any new grounds for the Iraqis. I'm, I'm sure every Iraqi will read chapters of this book and say, yeah, but so what? I mean, I lived through all of these things. And this is uh, this was also my, my goal to bring these lives, these experiences to, you know, to the Western reader, because, you know, when I start, first started writing this book, I didn't, it wasn't my intention to exclude any American voice from this book. But at one point I thought, you know that what? This is a, bo a book about Iraqis. I don't want anywhere. I know the Americans are there, they're manning their checkpoints, they're in the back of their tanks, but let the Iraqis tell their own stories. And you do it very well. The violence, however, overwhelming violence. The only thing I, th I can think comparable to this scale of violence is the uh, Second World War. Uh, the continual violence against civilians and how no one is safe. I'm thinking of Mosul and Ramadi and Fallujah. Yeah. Is that is that lifting? Do people feel safe again in those neighborhoods or are they still loud noises make them jump? I mean, it is the violence is reduced dramatically in Iraq, but but the the, the lack of violence doesn't mean peace. The, the lack of war is not translated to peace. It just means 
you know, the weapons are there, the, all the perpetrators of violence are there. And this is the other problem with the Iraq war. 20 years late, later, there is no accountability. No accountability to Maliki, to other politicians, other warlords, militia commanders, nor for the people who perpetrated this war, the people who led this war, the people who decided to invade Iraq. There's no accountability. Right. People are painting and, and, and living their lives. Uh, and we still don't know till this day how many civilians died in Iraq. 150,000, 250,000, half a million. And these are all estimates. And that is the problem with the Iraq war, accountability and justice to the, to the civilians. Raith Abdullah Haad, a stranger in your own city, travels in the Middle East long war. I'm John Batchelor.